G'day, it's Jamie, and welcome to Mose My Yowie. Today, I'm reading a newspaper article that was written by Ernest Favink, who was an explorer and author who wrote several books on discovering Australia and exploring Australia. And this is about a Yowie experience he had near the Gascoigne River in the 1880s. So we'll get into it. This was published in the Sydney Evening News, Saturday the 13th of February, 1897. Titled, Jimbras of Western Australia by Ervis Favink. The things he related happened in Western Australia many years ago in the early days of gold discoveries. I have constantly expected to hear more on the matter since, but have not done so, but it will come some day. Camels were not so common then as they are now, and my mate and I had pushed out prospecting with horses, which were used to the country, and in excellent condition. We got well into the interior, having been lucky in getting water, but not very lucky in prospecting. One afternoon, we came on a little family of Aborigines, camped at a bit of a rock hole, and managed to make friends with them. There was a white-headed old man, two women, and three or four kids. When they got used to us, we tried to get something out of them about the country ahead, but were not very successful. The old man, whose name was Bujin, gave us to understand that there was water and the hills up to the northeast, but was urgent in explaining to us not to go there. He kept repeating the word, Jimbra, Jimbra, but we could not understand him. He seemed much hurt at his failure to explain himself, seized us by the arms and squeezing them, grinning horribly the while. We concluded that Jimbra meant some sort of animal, but could not place it anyhow. Next morning, the old man took us to the top of the rock mound and showed us the hills he had spoken of far off to the northeast. They looked only a short day's journey, so after giving the Aborigines some trifling presents, we started. It was mostly desert country until we reached the neighbourhood of the hills when we struck a creek and the most encouraging change took place. Following the channel, it at last led us up into a little pocket amongst the ridges, fairly grassed and timbered. Here we found a small stoke or spring sufficient for our wants. We had not seen any sign of Aborigines, so camped with great satisfaction, for we had not expected to get half as much, half as such a good camp. In the middle of the night, I awoke, and the air being trifling chilly, I got up and put the fire together. The flames blazed up cheerily, and I lit my pipe and squatted I beside it, half asleep and half awake. Suddenly, across the fire, I saw a, a face, a black face, but not the face of an Aborigine. What the exact difference was, I could not then tell, for I was too much taken by surprise, but it was more revolting and horrifying than any face I had ever seen, but it was still human. Then it flashed across me that it was there for no good, but as I grabbed for my revolver, the thing vanished into the darkness and I heard its quick retreating footsteps. I did not fire for fear of hitting one of the horses, not knowing exactly where they were. I roused up my mate Bergholm and told him of my adventure, which he scarcely believed until morning broke and we looked up the tracks and they were those of a man. The horses were all well and as we ate our breakfast, we made our plans for the day, which included looking up our nocturnal visitor. Taking two riding horses, we proceeded to inspect the pocket wherein we found ourselves. It was a wonderful little patch of country to exist in such an isolated manner in the midst of the desert. And what made it more remarkable was the luxuri luxuriant way in which the trees grew on the banks of the creek. They were as close together as if they were on some coastal creek in a temperate climate. We found two or three likely patches for prospecting and presently 
towards the middle of the day, returned to our camp to follow up the track of our intruder. It did not go far, only to the bank of the creek, where it strangely disappeared, and nothing could we further find of it, although we were both fair trackers. During our inspection of the valley, we had noticed native, native tracks, but no sign of any camp. In the afternoon, I proposed we should go up to one of the highest hills and see, if possible, how far the good country extended. Selecting one with a good spur, up which we could ride or lead our horses, we started. The last part was rather rough, and we had to lead our horses up to the crest. From the top, we had a fine view. The range, which was surrounded by a good country, seemed quite isolated, and we could see into the distant desert, seemingly all round it. Various other gullies, like the one we were camped in, ran down to different points on the compass. And in fact, the place seemed like an island in a sea of aridity. After noting all we could, we descended and had reached that part of the spur where we could ride again, when suddenly a huge boulder came bounding down the hill straight after us. We were just mounting and the blessed thing shot past us like a steam engine. Luckily, not giving us a chance to try and dodge it, or we should have probably got right in its road. We pushed on as fast as we could, but another came thundering down, though wide of the mark. When we got to a moderately safe place, we stopped and looked at one another. Is that your friend from last night? said Bergholm. He'd better not show himself any more, I returned, or he'll get a bullet through him on spec. We rode home feeling rather uncomfortable. It was not pleasant to have such neighbours. On the way back, we were riding by the bank of the creek underneath the trees I spoke of, when suddenly there was a sharp crack overhead and a dead limb of a tree we were under came crashing down. Our horses had naturally started of the, startled of their own accord at the rendering breaking noise above their heads and the limb fell, fell clear of us. We stared in wonder at each other, but it was not impossible to say whether the occurrence was natural or not. The limb was dead and ripe for falling, but we could detect no trace of anyone up in the tree, but taken in conjunction with the boulders, it was a very singular coincidence. We made up a roaring fire and kept it going all night, keeping watch by turns. Nothing happened, but some distance away we found many native tracks as though someone had been prowling about. In the morning, we went to one of the places we had noticed the day before and did a little prospecting. We got a small show in a reef, but nothing very wonderful. And about midday, I went back to the camp to get the midday meal ready, leaving Berg home, pottering around the reef. I was riding quietly, and when I got close to the camp, I suddenly saw there was somebody there. I pulled up and watched. It was a naked black, a hideous looking being, shock headed, with no forehead and projecting draw, long arms and body, and short legs. He was a type of all that was fearsome and revolting. He was wandering through the camp, picking up things and seemingly, seemingly trying them with his teeth. Some he twisted and threw away. I had come up under cover of a bit of scrub and was pretty close. Remembering the boulders, the dead limb and witnessing the destruction of our property in this manner, I did not hesitate in getting out my rifle and firing at the brute. I hit him in the body and he fell but jumped up again and bit the wound like a hurt dog and then took to his heels and ran to the creek with astonishing speed, I after him. He reached the bank first, but the loss of blood was too much for him and he fell gasping. I cautiously got off and approached him, keeping my rifle ready. He glared at me out of his small red eyes and made an effort to rise, but it was in vain. 
While I was looking at him wonderingly, Bergheim came galloping up to see what I was firing at. Good God, what a monster, he exclaimed. And at that moment, I fairly screamed in pain. Incautiously, I had stood too near the monster and, throwing out one hand, it caught me around the ankle. Never did a man feel such grip of physical force. The relentless crushing of machinery is all that I can compare it to. The agony was so awful, as though the bone was being pulverised beneath the pressure. Then I blew the brains, the brute's brains out with my rifle and, almost, and dropped almost fainting. I pulled myself together after a bit and we examined the monster closely and measured him. The thickness of his body was enormous and the length of arms. His legs were short and did not display the abnormal strength of his arms. His head was human shape and that was all you could say, for otherwise it was that of a brute. I examined my ankle, and though there was nothing actually broken, it was still almost numb with pain, and I could only stand with Bergheim's help. Well, this is a nice crowd we have got amongst, he said. If this is your friend of the other night, I suppose his sisters and his cousins and his aunts will be inquiring after him. I'm afraid so. Let's get back to camp and see what the damage he has done. It was fearful pain having to limp to the camp, but I did it somehow. It was in great disorder. Our quart pots were squeezed flat by the creature's grip, a pack saddle torn up, and the iron twisted as one might twist a piece of wire. It's lucky he didn't find one of us in the camp, said Bergholm. Well, he's not done very much damage after all. Let's have some grub and discuss the best thing to do. By Jove, these must be Jimbras that old man was so anxious to warn us about, I said. As if in answer to what I said, a shrill cry arose behind me and looking around, we saw a white-headed head old Aborigine making signs to us. By Jove, it's that old Bujan, come after us, said Bolgheim, and beckoned him to him. Whether the old man had really followed us to see how we were getting on, or in the hopes of getting a few pickings in case we had been killed, I am unable to say. But he was very glad to see us, and mighty hungry and thirsty too. Jimbra, he exclaimed when he saw I was crippled. I nodded, and after we had finished eating, Bergholm took him down to the dead body. They returned after some time, Bergholm looking rather upset. We're in a nice fix, he said. That is if we stop here. These Jimbras are a nice crowd. They live mostly in the trees, it seems, and they have the strength of about 10 men. They catch these poor devils of Aborigines when they camp here, and how do you think they kill them? while well, they get them up against a tree and put their arms around and crush them. Phew! There are bones against every tree along there. What shall we do? Well, we can go straight away, but there's a good show. I don't believe in being frightened away by a lot of man monkeys. We might camp outside and keep watch. Old Budgeon says, they don't venture out where the trees are small and far apart. We could carry water out and bring the horses in to feed, and old Budgeon to keep watch while we work. That'll do. It's a pity to leave this place without giving it a good try. And if there was a rush set in, I'm afraid the Jimbras would have to go. I must try and get my leg right as soon as I can. Bujan says these gullies are full of them and that they, are, they must eat one another. Just then there was a fierce yell from the creek and we both saw a jimbra come swiftly down one of the trees and disappear under the bank, having apparently gone to the body. Next minute it appeared coming desperately towards us. 
Good God, it's a woman, said Belheim. We must shoot her. It seemed a, thing, a fearful thing to pull the trigger on a woman, but she was mad with rage at the death of her mate, and it was her life or one of ours. Together, I said, and the two bullets stopped her halfway. It was not safe policy to fire together, but neither Bergham nor I, Bergham nor I wanted to know whose bullet it was. Her cry seemed to have raised the gibbers in all directions, for now they answered all around, and nearly twenty must have appeared from all quarters approaching us. Fire to wound them, said Bergholm, and when they came within a shot I did so, and it was good policy, for the wounded ones snarled and shrieked, and the others came around to look at their wounds, and altogether it was the most horrid sight one ever saw. They soon had enough of it and retired discomfited, and we proceeded to follow out Bergholm's suggestion. Old Budgen was greatly elated to see these terrible enemies put to flight, and he was of great use to us finding the nearest available camp which, in his opinion, was safe from Jimbrus. We kept a couple of horses tethered, for naturally the main body made back to the water back to the better grass in the pocket, and it would not do to venture out there on foot after them. And so for some days we kept that work, but such a ghastly experience I ever had. I forgot to say that that same night, the two bodies of the male and female jimbras were both devoured, picked clean to the bones. Grim, cruel faces would suddenly peer out of the foliage overhead, a hideous figure making threatening gestures in the distance, but we had given them too good a listen for them to come near us. We visited, visited most of the other gullies, and truth to tell, got a little for our pains. There was gold there, but what we got no show worth speaking of. We sca scarcely gave the place a fair trial, for those awful jimbras got on our nerves and haunted us day and night. They never touched our horses. I think they must have got fooling around one, a noted kicker, and he got, had established a funk. My ankle got a little easier and I could walk a bit. When one day we were working at the reef, old Budgen, as usual, on the lookout, when Bergholm got a bit of stone in one eye. He tried to get it out by bathing it in a quarter pot, but it did not come out and thoughtlessly he started down to the creek to bathe. Old Budgen had been looking the other way, and only turned round as Bergholm's head disappeared. Instantly he went almost frantic, dancing and yelling, which awoke me to the sense of danger, and I too shouted to Bergholm to come back. For answering there came a wild scream for help, and snatching up my rifle I ran as hard as I could to the bank, accompanied by Budgen. Too late. A huge jimbra had caught Bogholm, thrown him across his shoulder like a child, and was running at full speed across the creek. I could not fire at his body for fear I should hit my mate, and although I fired at the creature's legs, my hand shook so th thorough running with the lame leg across the hot and heavy sand that I missed him and he reached the further bank unhurt and disappeared among the tree trunks. I could follow him by Bergholm's cries, and the Jimbra soon began to climb a thickly foliaged tree. Try as I would, I could not get a shot at him as he ascended, until at last, with a mighty spring, he bounded onto the next tree, one of the tallest gums in that part of the creek. Now I saw him distinctly, but a successful shot would bring them both down and the fall would be fatal to Bergholm. Suddenly, to my horror, the brute, seemingly hanging on by his feet and one hand, held his victim out by the back of the neck, shaking him as if in sport over the drop. As he turned back to the tree, I saw Bergholm glass the trunk desperately with his arms and legs. Hold on, I yelled, and fired but my unsteady hand only inflicted a sharp flesh wound, 
Fortunately, it was the best thing that could have happened. Leaving hold of his prey for a moment, he roared and shook his huge hand at me below as I jammed in another cartridge. In doing this, he exposed the hole of his great breast, and the next minute the bullet went through it. He dropped like a stone, leaving Bergholm clinging desperately to the trunk of the tree. Fortunately, fortunately, there was a limb not far below him, and he managed to slip down into the fork, where he could rest. His position was still critical. How was I to get him down that long naked trunk after being half squeezed to death by those arms, now helpless enough, I did not know. Although I couldn't catch sight of the brutes, I knew many of the tribe had been attracted by the fiery and were watching around unseen. What to do, I knew not. Presently old Budgeon touched me and made motions like a chopping of a tomahawk and then pointed to himself. I guess what he meant, he would cut steps after the manner of a man and go up and help Bergholm down. It was just the thing, and then I felt cold, very cold. The tomahawk was at the reef. How could it be got? The reef was very probably held by the Jimbras, and I could not leave my watch over Bergholm to go and disperse them and get the tomahawk. Then Budgen did a very brave thing. He motioned that he would go and get the tomahawk. I hesitated. I could only go halfway and protect him. No, no Jimbras could reach Bergholm in that time, and if the camp was clear, Budgen might be quick enough to get there and back before the brutes could descend. I made him understand that I would come halfway, and we started. Being an Aborigine, I could not trust him with a revolver, otherwise there would not have been much danger. Arriving halfway, Budgen darted off like a startled wallaby, and I went back, only just in time. A Jimbra had just jumped onto the gum tree, intending to bring Bergholm down. He was plain potting for me, and two shots brought him headlong in the creek beside his comrade. In a minute or two, I heard brave old Budgen running and panting. For a wonder they had not visited the camp, being too much engaged, I supposed, in the capture of Bergholm. I made Budgen understand to cut the notches deeper, and not so far apart as usual. I was greatly afraid that they would spring on him when he was passing the place where the two had already sprung and made him understand to cut the notches on the opposite side of the tree. He had brought me Bergholm's rifle from the camp so that I had two instantaneous shots handy. It was a weary time watching Budgen's progress and it must have been terribly hard for him but he was tough. When he approached the ticklish spot, I thought I detected movement in the foliage of the next tree, so fired on chance. I brought down my man. He hung by one arm, and I let him hang, for he kept away any more until Budgen was up above. Then I dropped him to lie him alongside the others. When Budgen reached Bergholm, he found him in great pain from the terrible squeezing he had undergone but cheered up by the presence of somebody. He mustered up what strength he had left to make an effort to descend. Budgen descended first, placing Bergholm's feet in the notches he had cut, and slowly and painfully they at last reached the ground. The Jimbras still kept themselves concealed with wonderful art, and after much pain and trouble we reached the reef. The Jimbras had gone there as soon as Budgen had paid his flying visit and destroyed everything. But that didn't matter much. Our horses had fled away a short distance. They took everything with supreme indifference. Bergholm could scarcely ride to camp, but my, by making slow progress, I managed to get him there. And much relieved, I felt. Bergholm was wild with vengeance. The horror of that moment when the Jimbra held him out from the tree would remain forever in his memory and he longed to clear the whole lot out. I was for leaving the place at once, and at last persuaded Borgholm to consent. I had quite enough of the Jimbras, and the gold prospect was nothing very promising. We took a last look around the place before leaving. When Borgholm got better, 
partly in hopes of having a shot at our foes, but they kept well hidden. The bones of those in the creek showed that a hideous feast had been enjoyed, and at the tree butts we saw the bones of many more crushed victims. We managed to reach old Bujan's camp and camped there a bit. I cut out a collar for him to wear out of a salmon tin so that he might be recognised as a friendly Aboriginal by any whites who came after us. We left the fellow enough presents to make him the millionaire of his tribe. Whites may have found their way out there since we were there, but if so, I fancy they must have missed seeing Bujan and gone to their fate. I forgot to say that I scrawled a message to any whites that came out that way telling of the Jimbras and left it with Bujan to show them. Our story received no credence, of course, when we returned, but Bergham and I will carry the marks to our grave. The end. Well, that's just the most amazing story I've ever heard. That's unbelievable. Okay, so that's it for me. I'll get back to you all next time. Bye.